Greetings and welcome to another lecture in Introductory Psychology. This one deals with memory, specifically the different levels of storage for memories, whether we store things for an extremely short period of time or potentially permanent period of time. Uh, now the model that I'm going to be talking about here, and the one that is most often used in psychology, it is called the atkinson schifrin model. You really don't need to know these names. Okay, I'm mostly, you don't, I'm mostly giving you these names because it's an example of what I like to humbly call Fossbender's Law of Science, which is, if you wish to become immortal, discover something in science, preferably something basic, and name it after yourself. And people will learn your name for hundreds of years, or at least until you're proven to be wrong. And indeed, there were psychologists called Atkinson and Schifrin who came up with this particular model. Now the nice thing about the atkinson schifrin model is that other than its name itself, it's named after exactly what these stages do, what they are. A lot of things in psychology are, which is convenient. The first level of memory is called sensory memory. And it's so called because in sensory memory, memories are stored in their original sensory form. Essentially, they're not encoded yet. You know the stages in memory, encoding, storage, and retrieval. And this is why things get a little weird, because technically this is the second stage, but sensory memory actually occurs before they're encoded. They're stored in their original sensory form. They have not been processed yet. Needless to say, these, these memories tend to be very, very, very short, although some are shorter than others. Now, we have five senses that everyone agrees on. I can think of two of them where we definitely have sensory memory. I'm not so sure about taste or smell or touch. Uh, that gets a little strange, particularly with the chemical senses, taste and smell, because it's difficult to say whether it's memory or whether it's simply those chemicals are still hanging around. But we definitely have sensory memory for hearing. It's called echoic memory. Note the word echo in there. Okay. If you've ever played with echoes, where you go and you holler up against a cliff or a tall building or something and it bounces back at you, then that's essentially kind of what we're talking about here, in that the information is kept in its original sensory form. It is not processed in the same way that echoes come back to you in their original sensory form. They're not processed. Now, echoic memory can last usually at maximum about three or four seconds. And the odds are you've experienced echoic memory, if you've ever been in this situation. Person A is talking to person B. Person B is not listening, but doesn't want person A to know that. So person A, while concentrating on something else, is spending a lot of time at, at, at whenever person A stops talking, going, uh-huh, hmm, 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 oh, yeah. Ah, mm. Now person A realizes that person B is not listening and confronts person B by saying, you're not listening. And person B says, yes I am, and immediately repeats the last thing that person A just said before that accusation. Which results in person A being stunned because person A knows that person B wasn't listening. But if anyone is really flabbergasted here, it's person B. Because if you've ever been person B in this situation, it's like the words are coming out of your mouth and you have no idea where they're coming from. And you have no idea what you're going to say next. And it's true because you're essentially processing them and saying them at the exact same moment. Because that last three or four second bit of sound essentially is still somehow figuratively bouncing around your ear. <laughs> <laughs> or the connection between the ear and the brain, that sort of thing, waiting to be processed. Okay, that's a coic memory. And it's convenient, not only because it helps piss off person A, but also because, for instance, a professor says something, and it's possible that you can remember that last bit, you know, to write it down. Now, we also have sensory memory for vision. It's called iconic memory. An icon is something, it's like a, a symbol, for instance. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. Now, iconic memory lasts a much shorter period of time than echoic memory does. We're talking fraction of a second here, which makes sense. Human beings are visual creatures. We do not want, you know, uh, expired visions hanging around for three or four seconds before we get new ones in and can process them. So we tend to update our vision extremely fast. But 
I can also pretty much guarantee that you've experienced iconic memory. If you've ever gone to a movie theater and watched a good old-fashioned movie, not a digital one, but one with film. Or if you've ever played with a flip book. You ever played with a flip book that it's like a, a cartoon drawing and each drawing is very slightly different and you flip through it and it looks like the pictures are moving? Well, moving pictures are called that because it looks like pictures are moving. Although they're not, it's an illusion. And it's an illusion that's called the Phi Phenomenon, P-H-Y, Phi, excuse me, P-H-I, Phi Phenomenon, okay? Phenomenon also begins with P-H, by the way. It's why people who learn English as a second language hate it. Because why don't they spell it with F? But at any rate, it's called the Phi Phenomenon. What happens is, uh, I believe that normal motion picture film runs at 24 frames per second. And the reason that it looks like those still pictures are moving, whether it's in movie, film, or the one of those flip books is, you look at one picture and your iconic memory holds on to that for a fraction of a fraction of a second, just long enough until you see the next picture. And that memory causes you to blur those two pictures together, which then causes you to blur into the third and into the fourth and into the fifth 24 times a second. So instead of seeing a whole bunch of still pictures, you see smooth movement. Like I said, it's an illusion. And it's only an illusion that we can see because of iconic memory. If we did not have iconic memory, no one would have ever invented moving pictures because they wouldn't move. You'd see this picture and then that picture and then that picture. So even though sensory memory lasts a very, very, very short period of time, it's pretty important to help us understand our world. The next stage of memory is called short-term memory because it lasts, yes, it lasts a short term, okay? Um, we're usually talking a maximum of about 30 seconds here, 20 to 30 seconds, which may seem like a very short period of time, but it's plenty long enough, for instance, to hold a conversation. It's long enough for you to remember somebody's phone number to program it in your phone or to write it down. It's long enough to do all sorts of very useful things this short-term memory. Now the thing is, short-term memory is not only short in terms of how long it lasts, it's also short rather in how much it can hold. Short-term memory is called a limited capacity store. It can only store a certain amount, a certain number of things. Okay, And this number was more or less determined way back in the 1960s at the dawn of cognitive psychology by a researcher by the name of George Miller, who, by the way, was not the same guy that directed Mad Max in the Babe movies. Uh, yes, the same guy directed Babe, the cute little talking pig, and Mad Max Ultraviolence. Think about that for a second. Uh, but anyway, back to psychology. He discovered that short-term memory has a capacity of somewhere around seven pieces of information. He actually, this was the actual title from what I understand of the paper, the magical number seven plus or minus two. This was back when science was allowed to have a sense of humor. We've kind of lost that now, unfortunately, because it turns out that short-term memory can hold between seven, you know, seven plus or minus two pieces of information. For those of you who don't speak math, we're talking between five and nine pieces of information which doesn't seem like very much until you start thinking about that as well. How long is a local phone number? Seven digits. How long is a zip code? Five. How long is the zip code the post office wants us to use but we don't want to? Nine. And you can see why we might not want to because that's longer. <laughs> that's right up there at the edge. How long is a social security number? Go ahead and count. Nine. You know, it really does seem like we have a whole lot of numbers in particular that really fit in quite nicely at that magical number 7 plus or minus 2 range. Except one thing you need to remember, though, about magical number 7 plus or minus 2 is it's not necessarily just 5 to 9 numbers or letters or words or whatever. It's actually 5 to 9 chunks. Now, a chunk is a thing... Okay, it's an item. Or it's a group of similar things stored as a single unit. It's a group of similar things stored as a single unit. You could have more than one actual item in a chunk. Okay? And what we can remember is seven plus or minus two chunks of information. As an example, 
of what the glory that is chunking represents. Okay? Let's say that I decided to give you a list of 12 letters. 12. So it's more than 7 plus or minus 2. Okay? And I was going to ask you to try to remember these 12 letters. I'm going to show them to you for like 10 seconds, 5 seconds. And then I'm going to ask you to remember them for a minute. Okay? And since I am the nice one, I have decided to pre-chunk them for you, and therefore I show you this. And I show you this for five seconds. How easily do you think you would be able to remember those after five, after five seconds? Okay. Probably not very. What about this? Oh, you say if you grew up in the U.S. or Canada. Oh, and maybe Great Britain and Australia and other... Oh! That first thing I showed you with IBM C... I mean, that, that's not chunked. Those are not three chunks. Those are still 12 letters. But if you grew up in and around American culture, that second, IBM, CIA, USA, FBI, those are chunks. Because there may indeed be three number, three letters there, excuse me, but you learned them as one chunk. The same is true with phone numbers. When you give somebody a phone number, it's not like you give them, you're giving a local phone number. You're not giving them seven separate numbers. You're giving them three, and then you're giving them four. Social security number. We have three, we have two, we have four. Okay. Long distance phone number. We have one because that's a long distance, assuming and if you don't have a cell phone. And then we have the area code, which we always remember as one. If I'm zero, two and two, three and three, seven one eight. Okay, and then you have the first three. A phone number is either three or four chunks, depending on if you have the one in front of it. Your social security number is three chunks. A local phone number is two chunks. A zip code is one chunk. Or you could add that second chunk of four numbers that no one ever does. Okay. So. Do remember that when we're talking 7 plus or minus 2, we're talking chunks. We're not just talking letters or numbers or whatever. Lastly, we have long-term memory. And it's so-called because it is, at least in theory, permanent. We'll talk about forgetting in another lecture. Actually, another two lectures. But long-term memory is a more or less permanent store. It's kind of equivalent to the hard drive in your computer. Okay. Once you've saved it there, it's pretty much going to be there unless something happens to your hard drive. The same is true with your brain in a lot of ways. Once the information is there, it's going to stay there. Now, the thing about long-term memory, though, what makes it different from something like a computer, is that we don't tend to remember things in long-term memory exactly the way that we experienced them or the way that we read them. Our long-term memory works in paraphrase. We tend to put things in our own words depending on our own experience, our own examples. It's why it's so difficult to memorize a speech word for word if you've had a drama class or a speech class. Why do you have problems? Because you want to use your own words. Why? Because that's how your brain works. Okay? You want to use your own words. You want to put it your own way. Police officers have known about this for a long time. If you ever watch cop shows, okay? If you've got two people who are accused of a crime, do they, do they interview them together or separately? separately, right? You want to make sure they tell the same story, because if they tell wildly different stories, then you know that someone's lying. But what you don't know is that they also want to make sure that the stories are not too similar. Because if you get two or more suspects who tell the exact same stories in the exact same words, the exact same order, the exact same way, or, or similar enough, then you also know that they're lying that they got bet together and rehearsed that, okay, we get caught, we're going to say this, 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 and this. And if they all say it in the exact same way, from the same point of view, same word, same order, then you know that something's going on here. So here we are, the atkinson Schifrin model. Sensory memory, very, very, very short. Short-term memory, maybe 30 seconds. Long-term memory, potentially permanent. Long-term memory, by the way, also does not, as far as we know, run out. You have an unlimited capacity. Your brain does not get full, although it might seem like it at times, like, who knows, maybe now.